I'd like to start this weekend with uh, an invocation. Praise be to God, naked being, who wears this universe as its body, and whose name is I. Praise be to God, the amnus of all selves, although there are no selves, the isness of all things, although there are no things. Praise be to God, who conceals himself in existence and reveals himself as being. Praise be to God, who shrouds herself in time and proclaims herself in eternity. Praise be to God, whose movement is our longing and whose rest is peace itself. Praise be to God, for whom the world is its song and silence its prayer. In order to understand what prayer really is, it is necessary to understand what God is. And in order to understand what God is, it is first necessary to know what one's self is. Our understanding of God and thus of the practice of prayer depends upon our understanding of ourself. If we believe and feel that we are a person, a finite self, living in the body, sharing the limits and destiny of the body, we will consider ourselves to be a tiny fragment in a vast world. And as this tiny part of the world, it is natural for us to look out at the world and to wonder where all this came from, what existed prior to the world and out of what was the world created. And as a result of this, we project the idea of God beyond the world at an infinite distance from ourself as a person. And then as this person, we enter into a devotional relationship with God. God is considered to be the the ultimate object of our experience. It could be said that the highest state of the individual is to enter into a relationship of devotion to this Creator God. And this uh, devotional relationship with God is enshrined in much of the great religious literature. It 
places the individual in the right relationship with God. And I would like to share with you one such hymn uh, by George uh, Herbert, it was written in the 16th century, which beautifully expresses the devotional relationship to God of one who considers themselves to be a person. It is, in some sense, the most refined attitude of the person or separate self. It's sometimes referred to as the elixir. Teach me, my God and King, in all things thee to see, and what I do in anything, to do it as for thee. A man that looks on glass, on it may stay his eye, or if he pleaseth, through it pass, and then may heaven espy. All may of thee partake. Nothing can be so mean, which with this tincture, for thy sake, will not grow bright and clean. A servant with this clause makes drudgery divine sweeps a room as for thy laws, makes that and the action fine. This is the famous stone that turneth all to gold, for that which God doth touch and own cannot for less be told. This traditional path of devotion and surrender to God attenuates the separate self and purifies it. And gradually, any of us who have walked this devotional path knows that in this purification process, our understanding of God becomes increasingly refined. God loses its objective qualities and attributes. And in the, in the absence of any distinction between the one who prays the one who is prayed to, the devotee and the beloved come closer and closer until at some point there is this great recognition that the being that we are is God's being. The distinction between the, the lover and the beloved, the one who longs and that which is longed for, either suddenly or in most cases gradually dissolves. And there is this recognition that God's being is our being. In other words, our being is not something that belongs to us as a person. The person belongs to being. Being doesn't belong to the person. We do not own our being. There is no we or separate I who might own or not own being. There has never been any other being than God's being. A 
when I say God's being, I do not mean to imply that being is an, is an attribute of God. God simply is being. The God who we longed for or prayed to can never be an object of our longing. It is the source of our longing. Let any impulse in you to move away from your being come to rest in this understanding. Notice any impulse in you to move away from simply being towards some object of experience. To move away from being towards an object of experience is a residue of the old habit of seeking God outside of ourself. But in order to seek God outside of ourself, we must first set ourselves up as a self apart from God's self. And in doing so, we strengthen that feeling of separation. God lies at the source of our longing can never be an object of our longing. Our longing for God is in fact God's love for us. It is the gravitational pull of our being inviting us to return from the adventure of experience to the sanctuary of the heart. Our longing never finds what it is looking for. It comes to rest in what it is looking for. Prayer is not a, a movement from ourself towards God. It is a divesting of ourself of all the qualities or limitations that we seem to have acquired from experience. And the subsequent revelation of our being as infinite being, God's being, the only being there is. Infinite being is not something that can be known. It is what remains when nothing is known. It could be called divine ignorance. In the Bhagavad Gita it says what is known by the mind is unknown by God. And what is known by God is unknown to the mind. So prayer is simply to abide in the empty sanctuary of the heart. To know nothing, to be nothing, to seek nothing. Do not allow your being to become personalized by experience. Being is utterly intimate, closer than close. At the same time, 
impersonal and infinite. Let, let yourself be as impersonal as God and let God be as intimate as yourself. Being, infinite being is that from which everyone and everything derives its apparently independent existence. Thought divides it into names. Perception divides it into forms. As such, the activities of thought and perception fragment God's infinite being, making it appear as a multiplicity and diversity of objects and selves. None of those objects or selves are really objects or selves. They are simply movements of that which is modulations of the ever-present reality, God's infinite being. As the Sufi mystic Balayani said, and I paraphrase, God never creates anything. He is simply every day in a different configuration. Nothing is created. Nothing has its own independent being. All seeming things borrow their apparent existence from the only being that truly is. The being that shines in our experience of ourself as the amnes of being, the, the selfness of ourself and that shines in all seeming things as the isness of things. When my first teacher, Dr. Rose, first met the Shankaracharya, he said it was like seeing a man carrying a candle in the wind. Do not let the knowing of your being be extinguished by experience. When our attention lets go of its object, it gradually, in most cases, sinks back into the source of pure awareness from which it has risen. Likewise, when our longing or our devotion lets go of the object of its longing, lets go of the image of the beloved. It gradually sinks back into the objectless love from which it arose. Just as the awareness that is the source of attention is not itself a thought and cannot be thought about. So the love that is the source of our longing is not a feeling and cannot be felt. It is the natural condition of being 
of the infinite being. Being the sole reality of all that is. The infinite being knows nothing of separation or union. Separation and union only ex exists for the one who believes themselves to be separate and finite. It is only from that illusory perspective that there is separation from God and union with God. For being there is neither separation nor union. As Balayani said, otherness for him is him without otherness. That is love. Love is not a relationship. It is the absence of relationship. The collapse of the belief and the feeling that there are two beings to be united. In other words, love is the nature of reality. God clothes himself in name and form and appears as the universe. When God undresses, she reveals herself as being. Clothing itself in name and form is the activity of creation. Undressing is prayer. Be sensitive to any impulse in you to leave this cloud of unknowing in favour of the known. The sanctuary of the heart is dark. Nothing can be seen there. Nothing can be known there. Nothing can be sought there. Let the residues of becoming dissolve in being. Carl Jung said of Ramana Maharshi that he was like a white spot on a white page. There was no being in him other than God's infinite being. No self in him other than God's self. That's why Ramana Maharshi said, when the I, the, the letter I, when the I is divested of the I, only I remains. When our being is divested of all the limited qualities that it acquires from experience. It stands revealed as infinite being. As such, Forgetfulness of self is remembrance of God. This self-forgetting is the essence of prayer. We could equally say that remembrance of self, if by self we understand 
intimate, infinite, impersonal being is the ultimate prayer. Emptiness of self is the fullness of God. To know something other than God, one has to set oneself up as a separate subject of experience. One has to set oneself up as a self apart from God's self, a being apart from God's being. It is in this sense that knowledge of things is said to veil God's presence. But for one who knows their being as God's being, the world loses its concealing power and becomes a revealing power. It shines with its reality, shines with God's presence. With your, with your mind, know 10,000 things, but with your heart, feel only one reality. Once we have understood that our being is God's being, the only being there is, we can return to the traditional devotional literature that is contained in the great religious and spiritual traditions and understand that in spite of the fact that it is written in conventional dualistic language it really shines with this same understanding. And so I would like to leave you this evening with a, a prayer that I recite to myself every night before falling asleep. O oh my Lord, my whole being is yourself, and this mind which has been given to me is your consort. The life force, breath and energy which you have given me are your attendants. My body is the temple in which I worship you. Whatever I eat, or wear, or do, is all part of the worship which I keep on performing at this temple. Even when this body goes to sleep at night, I feel I am in union with you. Whenever I walk, I feel I am going on pilgrimage to you. Whatever I speak is all in praise of you. So whatever I do in this world in any way is all aimed at you. In fact, there is no duality in this life of union with yourself. 